Until the mid-1970s, the word cocaine was virtually unknown to most of the world, as there was little demand for its mass production, distribution, and consumption. However, this would soon change dramatically, as the reputation of cocaine spread far and wide. It promised a euphoric high and the ability to stay awake for extended periods, making users feel invincible. This potent pleasure came at a high cost, making it a lucrative product for those involved in its sale. The epicenter of this burgeoning cocaine market was undoubtedly the United States, and before long, the country was flooded with the drug. Among the infamous drug lords of this era, Pablo Escobar was one of the most well-known. However, there was another figure who collaborated closely not only with Escobar, but also with various other cocaine suppliers. This individual pioneered the use of airplanes for drug transportation, facilitating the smuggling of tons of cocaine into America. He was a partner of the renowned drug lord Carlos Enrique Letta, and even when apprehended by the police while transporting 660 pounds of marijuana, he received unusual apologies. This man's name was George Young, and his life story would later be depicted in the 2001 film Blow. Johnny Depp portrayed his character in a captivating manner. Although the movie did not fare exceptionally well at the box office, it garnered a substantial following, with many people captivated by George Young's tumultuous journey. While the film may have taken artistic liberties with certain aspects of his life, Young's life as a successful drug dealer was undeniably unforgettable and filled with excitement. But did his life ultimately conclude as tragically as depicted in the movie? George Jacob Young was born on August 6, 1942, in Boston, marking the beginning of a remarkable and complex journey. The Young family subsequently relocated to Weymouth, Massachusetts, where his father was a struggling business owner. Money was consistently tight, but they managed to meet their basic needs. As a child, George made a firm decision that poverty would not be his fate. While not the top academic performer in school, he excelled in soccer and exhibited the qualities of a natural leader both on and off the field. Despite being a relatively average guy and not a troublemaker, George found himself in legal trouble for the first time during high school. He was arrested for soliciting a prostitute, unknowingly engaging with an undercover police officer. This initial encounter with the law would not be his last, but he persevered and managed to graduate from high school. Afterward, George enrolled at the University of Southern Mississippi with plans to pursue a degree in advertising. However, he was unable to complete his studies as he was soon introduced to something that would profoundly shape his life. The turning point in George's life revolved around marijuana. He and his friend decided to seek a better life in Manhattan Beach, California, where everything seemed different. Abundant sunshine, beautiful beaches, attractive girls, and an overall vibrant and liberating atmosphere. To fully savor this newfound lifestyle and sustain their love for weed, they needed a substantial amount of money. Selling small quantities of marijuana they bought wouldn't cut it. Their breakthrough came when an old friend, visiting Manhattan Beach for the summer, offered assistance. During a party, marijuana featured prominently, and one of their friends, enticed by the quality, inquired about its cost. Learning that they could acquire a kilogram for just $60, he marveled at the opportunity, knowing that it could fetch five times as much on the East Coast. This price differential represented a significant profit margin for the time. The challenge now was how to transport the marijuana hundreds of miles without incurring losses. George's girlfriend, who worked as a stewardess, became their solution. She discreetly carried the cannabis to Amherst, Massachusetts, where it quickly sold out. The net profit from each kilogram was a substantial $200. It was an initial success that had to be built upon, especially considering the seemingly insatiable demand on the East Coast. With a growing supply and expanding operations, George Young evolved into a well-known marijuana dealer in the East, and money flowed in steadily, creating a prosperous venture. Despite his youthful exuberance, George had a taste for the high life, indulging in parties and the company of women. However, the money he was making still fell short of his desires. He realized that dealing with middlemen in California who set their own prices and rules was not the most profitable route. George saw the need to establish direct connections with the suppliers, eliminating intermediaries. 
the big question was where to find these suppliers, and without much forethought, George impulsively embarked on a trip to Mexico. Notably, he knew neither a word of Spanish nor much about Mexico itself, and he had no leads on where to locate the marijuana supplier. It was a journey into the unknown. The decision was seemingly random, spurred by George's recollection of a movie, Night of the Iguana, featuring Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, which had been filmed in Puerto Vallarta. George, accompanied by his friends, spent two weeks in the area, but their mission proved challenging, hindered by their lack of Spanish language skills. As their frustrations mounted, they began to realize that their endeavor might be in vain, and they yearned to return home. On their last day in Puerto Vallarta, they had a fateful encounter with an American hippie girl who agreed to provide them with a ride. Little did they know that this chance meeting would be their saving grace. During the conversation, the girl mentioned that she lived with a Mexican man who had access to what George sought in abundance. They quickly made arrangements to meet him. To their surprise, this Mexican man turned out to be the son of a Mexican general, somewhat eccentric but willing to do business. He supplied George with significant quantities of marijuana at a remarkably low price, $20 per kilogram. In contrast, in California, the same quantity of marijuana commanded a far higher price. George had successfully secured marijuana for $60 per kilogram through intermediaries, marking a significant milestone in his operation. The remaining challenge was the transportation of this marijuana to the United States, and George's adventurous spirit led him to personally pilot the first flight, despite his limited flying experience. As expected, the flight proved to be a harrowing experience, with George's lack of expertise nearly jeopardizing both the transportation operation and his own safety. He found himself lost over the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean, deviating about a hundred miles off course, and darkness was closing in. Panic set in as George struggled to determine his location. In this dire situation, he made a pivotal decision to change course and spotted a mountain pass that would serve as both a landmark and an escape route. Eventually, the plane safely reached its destination, but the ordeal left George with a resolute vow never to transport cargo by plane without the expertise of professional pilots. It was a valuable lesson learned. With the business flourishing, George and his friends leased a beachfront villa in Puerto Vallarta. Their earnings soared to an impressive monthly range of fifty dollars to $100,000. They typically conducted two trips each month. In addition to the plane deliveries of marijuana to California, they had to embark on a three-day journey eastward in a motorhome to reach Amherst, their other distribution point. The business demanded hard work and dedication, but none of them complained. They were young, driven by ambition, and fully committed to their enterprise. This prosperous venture unfolded in the year 1974. The thriving enterprise eventually came to a screeching halt when George was apprehended in Chicago with a substantial haul of 660 pounds of marijuana, intending to hand it over at the Playboy Club. Unfortunately, the individual he was supposed to meet had connections to the heroin trade. To mitigate his own sentence, this contact revealed George's name. Surprisingly, federal agents didn't display much enthusiasm for arresting him, expressing regrets along the lines of, We're sorry, we don't particularly want to target marijuana-related cases, but this is linked to a heroin operation, so we have to take you in. Consequently, Young was convicted and sentenced to federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut. However, this prison term would significantly shape his future, albeit in an entirely different realm. It was not marijuana, but a far more severe substance, cocaine, that would become George's expertise in the confines of Danbury. To George's surprise, Danbury Prison proved to be an unexpected hub of knowledge, populated by intelligent and articulate businessmen who had, in one way or another, transgressed the law. Among its eclectic inmate population were bankers, lawyers, doctors, and seasoned smugglers, Within these walls, one could glean insights into virtually every facet of illegal activities. It was, in essence, a genuine school of criminal arts. It was in this unusual setting that George crossed paths with Carlos, a man from Colombia. Carlos was well-mannered, impeccably dressed, and fluent in English. He found himself behind bars for car theft, but his true interest lay beyond automobiles. While incarcerated, 
Carlos was nurturing an audacious plan to amass millions of dollars. His scheme centered on finding a way to transport cocaine out of Colombia and distribute it in the United States, an ambition that would dramatically alter George's life. Fate seemed to have orchestrated a fortuitous match when George found himself sharing a prison cell with Carlos, who was actively seeking a skilled smuggler with significant experience in transporting contraband, particularly marijuana. It was as if destiny had brought the very man Carlos was looking for into the same cell as him. George, who had been primarily involved in transporting marijuana, did not perceive his actions as illegal or morally wrong. He convinced himself that he was merely fulfilling the desires of young people, viewing marijuana as relatively harmless. Although he knew he was breaking the law, his moral compass was oriented differently when it came to marijuana, and he harbored a stark aversion to heroin, refusing any involvement with it. Carlos' letter, on the other hand, had an entirely distinct substance in mind, cocaine. At the time, cocaine was a largely unknown and scarcely available drug in the United States, with few people aware of its remarkable effects. The market was wide open, and the potential for immense profits was staggering. George was initially unfamiliar with cocaine and had little interest in delving into it. However, everything changed when George learned of the staggering profit margins associated with cocaine. Carlos revealed that in Colombia, a kilogram of cocaine could be acquired for four to five thousand dollars, while in the U.S., the same kilo could fetch a staggering sixty thousand dollars. These numbers were enough to capture George's imagination, and he realized that a single flight in the cocaine trade could potentially eclipse all the earnings he had amassed from years of marijuana smuggling. With no more hesitation, the two inmates set to work crafting a plan that would eventually yield them millions of dollars. Day by day, George and Carlos meticulously refined their strategy. Carlos utilized his time in prison to converse with bankers and experienced smugglers, scrutinizing every minute detail that could prove valuable for their scheme. His thirst for knowledge was insatiable, and he knew that his release from prison was just a matter of time. This grand plan began to take shape in the year 1975. George Young and Carlos Letter were released from prison, and they had a clear plan even before Carlos left for Colombia. They had agreed that upon Carlos's arrival in Colombia, he would send a telegram to George's parents' home to set their grand scheme in motion. Over the phone, they coordinated the details for George to find two women who would unknowingly transport cocaine in their suitcases from Antigua to the United States. It took George several days to locate two rather unsuspecting young women who were enticed by the idea of having a bit of fun in Antigua. Astonishingly, they showed no fear about the fact that they would be unwittingly smuggling drugs in their luggage. These girls were entirely ignorant about the cocaine hidden in their suitcases, which worked in everyone's favor. Fortunately, the operation unfolded without a hitch, as the girls successfully delivered the cocaine and they enjoyed their time with George and Carlos so much that they willingly returned to Antigua to transport more drug-laden suitcases. This second venture was equally successful. Now, with their operation proving profitable, the need for expansion became apparent. To achieve this, an airplane was essential. Previously, cocaine had been transported solely via suitcases or luggage, a less efficient and riskier method. Acquiring an airplane would streamline transportation and substantially boost profits, so they wasted no time in purchasing one and hiring a professional pilot. George and Carlos established the Bahamas as their primary loading station for the cocaine shipments. They discovered that flying cocaine into the United States was a relatively straightforward and lucrative endeavor. Consequently, the number of flights began to surge. Despite their already substantial earnings, the partners thirsted for more, which meant acquiring more money and, subsequently, more cocaine. George Young crossed paths with a man who would go on to become the most infamous drug lord in history, Pablo Escobar. The Colombian drug lords were deeply impressed by the shrewd tactics employed by Carlos Letta and George Young in transporting and distributing drugs in the United States. While Colombia had an abundant supply of cocaine, the logistics of getting it into America presented numerous challenges. George Young was called upon to address these complications, and arrangements were swiftly put into motion. 
Carlos and George embarked on the ambitious endeavor of shipping large quantities of drugs from Colombia to the United States. Their operations soon became the cornerstone of the notorious Medellin Cartel, a thriving criminal organization. Their smuggling operation followed a routine. On Friday nights, a plane would depart from the Bahamas to Escobar's ranch in Colombia, remaining overnight. On Saturdays, the plane would return to the Bahamas, strategically concealed amidst the heavy air traffic leaving the Caribbean for the mainland. Amidst a multitude of radar blips, the lone dot representing their plane blended seamlessly. It remained undetected until it descended below radar range and safely landed on U.S. soil. By the late 1970s, the cartel was responsible for supplying approximately 80% of all the cocaine in the United States, thanks to George Young's expertise and connections. Money flowed in abundantly, and it was cleverly concealed within Chevy Blazers exported from the United States to Colombia. Carlos operated an estate and a dealership in Colombia, where he would acquire Chevy Blazers in the U.S., stashing the illicit funds within the car's door panels and various hidden compartments. During this era, cocaine became a normalized and accepted product, much like marijuana. The act of snorting cocaine was even considered somewhat ordinary, especially among those with higher incomes. Unbeknownst to the government, the media, as well as the recording and film industries, played unwitting roles in promoting cocaine. No one raised objections, and cocaine was perceived as a miraculous drug that provided an immense energy boost, allowing people to remain awake for extended periods and experience intense highs. It was seen as a superior alternative to marijuana. However, the true malevolence of cocaine eventually became evident as its negative consequences spread throughout America. The supply continued to grow, and the impact of this evil substance became undeniable. George Young, known as Boston, played a pivotal role in this dark chapter of the drug trade. George and Carlos' letter were deeply entrenched in their partnership, a bond unlike any other. However, this alliance was destined to reach its conclusion. Carlos Letta was a peculiar character with a peculiar range of interests, simultaneously admiring figures like John Lennon and Adolf Hitler. While not necessarily deranged, he displayed signs of unreliability as their operation flourished. Initially, all was harmonious, but the vast wealth and access to whatever he desired began to cloud Carlos's judgment. His financial ascent began with the purchase of Norman's Key, a small Bahamian island, for a staggering $4.5 million. The need for a transshipment base became apparent because small, single-engine planes couldn't cover the distance from Colombia to the U.S. without refueling. Norman's Key, located 340 kilometers off the Florida coast, proved to be the ideal midpoint. Here, the cocaine supply multiplied exponentially, and money flowed abundantly. Carlos's growing power led to extreme actions, including forcibly evacuating the island's residents from their homes. Some were able to escape with bribes, while others met unfortunate ends. The allure of power and wealth weighed heavily on his psyche, causing him to ultimately bid farewell to his long-standing partner, George. Interestingly, George Young didn't view Carlos Letter's departure as a negative development. In fact, he welcomed it. He had grown increasingly uncomfortable with Letter's business decisions, especially the purchase of Norman's Key Island, which he considered ill-advised. George believed that a constantly moving operation was the key to avoiding capture. He was alarmed by Carlos's eccentric thoughts, including the idea of taking control of the entire country of Belize. As Carlos accumulated more wealth, he started cutting corners by hiring unreliable and inexpensive pilots. Norman's Key Island, which had served as the primary conduit for Colombian cocaine into the United States for four years, descended into chaos, becoming a drug-fueled den where no rules seemed to apply. Carlos's behavior grew more erratic, fueled by his cocaine use, and he began placing trust in random, small-time con artists who posed significant risks and contributed to the deterioration of their partnership. The next question for George was how to sustain his income. Money was never a problem for Boston George. He continued to maintain close communication with Pablo Escobar. Moreover, now that George had established a closer relationship with the Colombian drug lord, he felt relatively secure about any potential threats to his life, 
just in case Carlos Letta ever harbored any intentions of harming him. George began receiving independent supplies and continued to ship cocaine to the United States, this time without his longtime partner. Working directly with Escobar, as it turned out, was no less unconventional than working with Carlos. During one visit to Medellin, George witnessed Escobar execute a man right in front of him. They were seated at a table on the patio when two bodyguards brought in an informant. Pablo calmly apologized to George, walked over to the man and executed him. Afterward, he returned to the table as if nothing had happened, asking George about dinner preferences. On another occasion, George saw Escobar's men throw someone off a hotel balcony, likely orchestrated confrontations designed to send a message. George had a clear understanding of the ruthlessness that Pablo Escobar could exhibit towards traitors, and this realization only strengthened his commitment to remaining loyal to Escobar. He knew he would never betray his powerful partner. Additionally, he began to comprehend the stark differences between the cocaine and marijuana businesses. The marijuana trade operated on trust and handshakes, whereas the cocaine trade was steeped in violence and constant danger. In this ruthless world, everyone was armed and ready for potential confrontations. The vast sums of money circulating within the cocaine business had a corrupting influence on many involved. George, however, abhorred the violence associated with the trade. He adopted a cautious and deliberate approach, striving to maintain composure amidst the chaos. While he could have exited the business at any point, his affinity for risk and the adrenaline of the trade kept him engaged. By 1987, George Young had amassed a staggering $100 million and had the added benefit of minimal tax liability thanks to an offshore account in Panama. He resided in a lavish mansion in Massachusetts, hobnobbed with celebrities at extravagant parties, enjoyed the company of beautiful women, and drove the finest cars. He was a shining star in the world of cocaine, and as we know, stars tend to shine brightly. The Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA, had George Young on its radar, and his house was under constant surveillance. It was only a matter of time before Boston George found himself behind bars once again. This turning point occurred in the year 1987. In a nighttime raid on George Young's home, law enforcement officers were hoping to find kilos of cocaine, but their search yielded only disappointment. They discovered a mere three or four ounces of cocaine in the house, which, although a small quantity, was sufficient for an arrest. The last image that George Young saw was his one-year-old daughter being taken away by a police officer. Boston George had not planned on spending more than five years in jail given the minimal amount of cocaine found in his residence. This belief prompted authorities to offer him a deal, a reduced sentence in exchange for his testimony against his former associate, Carlos Letter. George recalled the fate that had befallen those who had betrayed Pablo Escobar, and he swiftly declined the offer. Not long afterward, Carlos Letter himself was apprehended and extradited to the United States. The two former partners seemed to be following a similar timeline, but there was one notable exception. Carlos faced a significantly harsher sentence, so severe that a few weeks after his arrest, the Miami Herald reported that Carlos' letter had penned a letter to U.S. President George W. Bush, offering his full cooperation. Carlos' letter made a pivotal decision that would drastically alter his fate. He chose to cooperate with authorities and offer up every bit of information he possessed about the Medellin cartel, all in a bid for his own freedom. Upon learning of Carlos's decision, George Young had a change of heart and agreed to testify against his former partner. This choice was not made lightly. It was also a request from Pablo Escobar himself. Carlos' letter, who had once betrayed George and harbored intentions of betraying Escobar, was now facing the consequences. He received a life sentence without the possibility of parole, along with an additional 135 years. For Carlos, it marked the end of his freedom. However, prison did not spell the end for Boston George. Upon his eventual release, he seemed unswayed by the lessons life had taught him. The allure of adventure still held a powerful grip on him, and he grew restless without a job. In 1994, he resurrected his old business by reaching out to one of the pilots he had collaborated with back in the 1960s during his marijuana days. 
This pilot, who was a friend of George's, didn't hesitate to get involved in the new venture and make some money. The reunion of these old friends might have seemed promising, but there was a significant twist in the tale. Unbeknownst to George, his pilot friend was now working for the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA. The outcome closely resembled a scene from a movie. What started as a meticulously planned cocaine smuggling operation ended in yet another imprisonment for Boston George, marking another chapter in his tumultuous life. George Young found himself as the unexpected focal point of a meticulously planned operation by the Drug Enforcement Administration, DEA. Over his years in the drug trade, George had successfully smuggled narcotics on numerous occasions, often eluding capture. Even when apprehended, his time served in prison had been minimal. However, this time was different. George Young was apprehended red-handed with a staggering 1,754 pounds, approximately 796 kilograms, of cocaine inside a stolen plane. This was a far cry from the few ounces of cocaine that had led to his previous arrest. Facing such a colossal quantity, Boston George knew that his fate was sealed, and he was staring at the prospect of spending the rest of his life in prison. Before his sentencing, George had an open conversation with the judge who expressed surprise at his actions. With a net worth of $100 million and complete anonymity, George could have chosen to retire peacefully. The judge questioned why he didn't simply walk away. The answer, George explained, was that he had grown fond of the thrill, the risks and the freedom that came with his criminal lifestyle. Initially motivated by money, he had eventually reached a point where it no longer held any significance for him. It wasn't cocaine that he was addicted to, it was the lifestyle itself. In the end, George Young received a severe sentence for his addiction to this high-risk, vibrant, and free-spirited way of life. He was handed a 60-year prison sentence at the age of 54, prompting reflection on whether it had all been worth such a lengthy incarceration. However, Boston George didn't have to spend the rest of his life behind bars. His sentence was later reduced due to his good behavior. George Young served a 20-year prison sentence and was released on June 2, 2014. Remarkably, despite his beloved daughter's absence during his time in prison, they managed to rebuild their relationship after his release. The movie Blow had a profound impact on George Young's life, elevating him to a level of stardom. The film contained a powerful line that resonated with George's life journey. Life passes most people by while they're making grand plans for it. George's story is indeed remarkable. He led a full, vibrant and relatively uneventful life for someone involved in such a risky trade. Despite two prior prison stints before the age of 54, he received minor sentences both times. He managed to avoid the loss of loved ones, gunshot wounds, and constant incarceration that often plagues others in his line of work. He was one of the fortunate ones who survived the world of cocaine dealing. Yet, was George satisfied with his life? In one of his interviews, he reflected, We live as we die alone, and even though I spent 20 years in prison, a few more years incarcerated here and there, I've had so many great experiences in my life of living total free will, that I wouldn't change it for all the gold in the earth. George Young's journey came to an end on May 5, 2021, at the age of 78. Despite his involvement in the drug trade, his life story left an indelible mark, and he expressed gratitude for the impact of the movie Blow on his legacy.